Welcome to Real Estate Coaching Radio, starring award-winning real estate coaches and number one international best-selling authors, Tim and Julie Harris. This is the number one daily radio show for realtors looking for a no BS, authentic, real-time coaching experience. What's really working in today's market, how to generate more leads, make more money, and have more time for what you love in your life. And now your hosts, Tim and Julie Harris. I remember, Julie, the first time you and I were exposed Mm -hmm. to the information we're going to be sharing with these guys today and probably tomorrow and the following day Mm -hmm. and maybe even the following day. Perhaps. um, On disc profiles. Mm -hmm. And we were in our mid-20s, if I remember correctly. Yes. And you and I were at a Howard Brinton event. Mm -hmm. And and it was one of the most um, interesting, transformative sales tools at that point in our careers that I think we had learned and this absolutely is absolutely useful. Yes. It was incredibly useful. Even after our first year where we, you know, listed and sold over a hundred homes and the second year and the third year. And for 10 years after that, we always did a hundred to 200 homes. This became one of the most critical building blocks in our ability to master the art and science of, of selling really and, mm-hmm. and, and selling, but also getting along with people, right? Communicating, being uh, yes. a good human. <laughs> I would say that it made all things easier. It did. To understand this. Now, you said uh, DISC profile, just if this is their first exposure. Sure. That's the DISC personality style profile system. And we're going to get into that, but we're going to make it really tactical and practical specifically for those of you in real estate. Right. So um, we're going to go through the way. So the DISC stuff, and, and many of you have been exposed to it, and we're going to be presenting this to you in probably a way that's unfamiliar, especially if you've been exposed to it in the past, because Julie and I have studied this stuff and presented it so many times and read so many books on and used it. Um, And really the interesting part of it, well, I'm going to resist getting wonkish about it, but the history of it is really what I find to be fascinating. And Julie's actually done some homework Mm -hmm. on that. But what we're going to be doing to Julie's point is we're going to keep this very practical and tactical. In other words, we're going to co- coalesce this content in such a way that you can take immediate action on it. And it doesn't just become something theoretical. It becomes something that you can immediately put into action and frankly, start helping more people and making more money without having had taken or asking them to take some big, long, you know, 14 analysis page DISC whatever. analysis. Yeah. Right. So what we're going to do is we're going to give you really what, in our opinion, are the, the most important elements in in a very practical and tactical way so that you can immediately start applying what really DISC is all about, the personality assessments are about, Mm -hmm. and then you can start being more versatile. So that's what this series of podcasts are going to be. And uh, this is a great topic. But first of all, Julie's done some homework. And as you guys know, especially those of you who are longtime podcast listeners, and this is the largest single, you know, most downloaded daily podcast for real estate agents, at least the United States, this podcast has been downloaded over, um, you know, we've done over 2000 shows, but over 20 million times. So, um, this information, if you use it correctly, can be very beneficial to your life. But if this information, if used incorrectly can actually be very detrimental. That's right. So let's understand a little bit more about this. I'm going to give you a bit of history just so you know where all this is coming from. This is again, the practical and tactical DISC personality training for real estate professionals. How do you actually use it? Because you can get really wonkish about this stuff. So the DISC model of behavior was first proposed in 1928 by William Moulton Marston, a physiological psychologist, in his book, which was at that time called Emotions of Normal People. (laughs) Obviously, not a book written for real estate people. (laughs) Exactly. All right. Now, Marston made a deliberate decision to focus only on psychological phenomena that were directly observable and easily measurable. Fair enough. So based on his research, Marston theorized that the behavioral expression of emotions could be categorized into four primary personality styles based on the subject's perceptions of themselves in relationship to their environment. And these four types were labeled by Marston as dominance, inducement, submission, and compliance. D-I-S-C. Now, these four styles are now commonly referred to, years later, as driver, influencer, or expressive, supportive, or amiable, and compliant, or analytical. Kind of interchangeable, but still in the D-I-S-C vein. There are many, many spins on this. 
including tests and books. It's commonly taught in sales training and business school. So this is important for you guys to get clear on. So I'm reading ahead in your notes. Yep. And by the way, our notes are always available for downloading on timandjulieharris.com. They're copywritten, but you guys can certainly use them. Uh, a lot of you guys use our training for uh, training your agents or training your uh, team members. Uh, so it, to Julie's previous point, a lot of the DISC stuff that Marston came up with was essentially reframed in the form of other books or uh, what people tried to uh, represent as their own original research on personality mm -hmm. styles without really crediting Marston as being the grandfather of this concept. But he really did start it. I he, mean, there's the platinum rule, there's the color code, exactly. there's Myers-Briggs, there's lots and lots of different versions of this. And ton of, it was mostly basically this stuff really started to boil up and became trendy in the late 70s. And mm -hmm. then the 80s into the maybe the very early 90s, but mostly in the 80s, there were a ton of those books and yes. every one of those books are still available at the bookstore too. Yes. And you know, it's important stuff, but we like to know where things come from. So Marston created a model that integrated those four types of emotional expression into a two-dimensional chart. He used the criteria of introvert versus extrovert and direct versus indirect to make that chart. And we'll draw that chart together later in this podcast. So William Marston was also known by a pen name of Charles Moulton and invented the prototype of what would then become a lie detector, kind of interesting. And he wrote a lot about self-help and created the character Wonder Woman, kind of that a versatile last, guy himself. But I that guess. last little bit, uh, when I tell people that, they they think I'm Looney Tunes. Yes, it's but, a fact. But it's fascinating, right? It tells you what how creative his mind was. Yeah, and versatile but, himself. But also, there was a uh, actually it was on Netflix, I think. There was another um, the movies that have been made about him, and he was very politically involved. He was very left leaning. Also polyamorous. I, I thought he was not polyamorous, but is I mean yeah. he had I mean yeah I guess yeah. that would be one way of saying it right. Mm -hmm. um, so he had a very abnormal or let's say non traditional approach to <laughs> Interesting life. Interesting life. Uh, but again, it, his creative genius with coming up with this original concept. I don't think anyone will argue um, is. You know, it's fascinating at the very least. And it's useful. So keep in mind that psychology is not a, what is called a hard science, meaning it's full of abstract concepts, theory, observational analysis, and conjecture. It is not the same as physics, chemistry, or biology, which have provable equations and actual laws. Now, most importantly, remember that DISC is not a science. It's a guide. It's so a don't, pseudoscience. So don't get too drunk on factual analytics and all that kind of stuff. And, and right there, I, I don't know if I'm talking on any of it's your okay. future notes, but right there is where most people who are purveyors of this content, who are experts, right, um, who are uh, poised in front of real estate brokerages, this is where they screw it up, yes. in our opinion. And they'll come up, they, they stand in front of a group and it's sort of like they're acting like somehow they can you know, read diagnose. the hi hieroglyphs and diagnose how it's a hard science. It's not. It's a pseudoscience. Pseudoscience is a classic way of saying it's fake science. So when you're listening to us present this information to you, I, it's really critical that you understand that this is pseudoscience at its best. And there's lots of reasons, and we're going we're gonna to tell you how to apply it. We're going to tell you how it's beneficial. But we're also going to point out to, uh, the ways it's been misused. And, that's right. And that's where... Frankly, harm has been done, especially amongst agents in these, you know, DISC trainers where they are making it so that people that did have capacity and capability and desire to be successful were pigeonholed as having the wrong personality like, for like success. Like a personality flaw in some sense. Exactly. If, with regards to business. There is no EKG for DISC, for example. Mm -hmm. Okay, exactly. so it's not a science, it's a guide. There's no specific, this is really important, guys. There is no specific personality style which is guaranteed to be successful or not successful in business or real estate or even in life. That is not a thing. So let's understand the philosophy, but also have some fun applying it in a practical and tactical way. What we want you to understand and implement is that it's your job to be more like your prospects and clients, not the other way around. And largely, Tim, this gets down to just being present and observational and a little bit sensitive to who you're in front of and not expecting them to instantly gel with you. But that last little sentence you read is really sort of the synopsis of basically one of the big takeaways. And the bottom line is, is don't make it about yourself. Make it about the person that you're talking to. That's it. So here's a fact. Agents and brokers who make the most profit in real estate are always those who understand versatility. Versatility means having the ability to handle a variety of types of personalities in a variety of situations with care and skill. Agents who are versatile rarely say things like, I only work with people who I hit it off with, 
or I just can't work with those analytical types or fill in any other personality style or she just needed too much handholding for me. Instead, their script is, it would be my pleasure to help you with fill in the blank. Those are the versatile agents who have by and large worked on this. So let's draw the chart and I'm gonna describe how to draw the chart. And in our notes, I can attach the actual chart since that's well, let's, let's make them do their own little we are, creative. We are, we yeah. are. Okay, so at, you're gonna get a fresh sheet of paper. At the top of the page, you're gonna put the label direct and at the bottom, you'll write indirect. It helps when we've presented this in the past. If we give them a visualization mm -hmm. of what you know in their mind's eye, what they can, what it looks like when it's done. So here's yes. basically the way for you guys to do that. You're just gonna, in essence, and Julie's gonna get into the specifics, but you're gonna take a you know an eight and a half by eleven, and you're gonna divide it into four quadrants. It looks like, I mean, you guys can visualize it, right? There's a, an equal, a line that divides it equally uh, on the horizontal and a line that, that divides the page equally on the uh, vertical. A big plus sign, essentially. Okay, so the top of the page, direct. On the bottom, you're going to write indirect. And on the left-hand side of the page, you'll write introvert. And the right side, you'll, you'll write extrovert. And you're going to draw these words fairly smallly because we're going to fill in this chart. So next, you're going to draw that big plus sign on your page to split it into quadrants. You'll have an upper left, upper right, lower left, and lower right quadrant. Now you're going to draw the letter D in the upper left, I in the upper right, S in the lower right, and C in the lower left quadrants. Again, that's D-I-S-C going around clockwise. So now we're going to label those driver, influencer, support, and communi communicator. That stands for D-I-S-C, driver, influencer, support, and communicator. Again, clockwise and write small because we're going to add some descriptions to each quadrant. Again, making this very practical and ta tactical. So in order to understand the chart, let's first test you, podcast listener. Put your finger in the middle of the chart and ask yourself if you're someone who is generally direct or indirect. Okay. Well, how do you know? Okay, slow your roll. So this is one of the first things that we're giving to you that makes all this rather obtuse information um, practical. It, listen to what Julie just said. So you've created your chart and let's go over this again, right? Because mm -hmm. it's worth sure. doing. Some of them are driving around or on their exercise, yeah. you know, bike or walking. Don't draw and drive, please. Don't draw and drive, right. So, but you know, you you can visualize obviously a piece of paper drawn into four se a separate quadrants and Julie in the upper, I'm looking at it now, the piece of paper is in front of me and the upper left-hand quadrant is what word? D for driver. And the upper right-hand quadrant is? I for influencer. Lower right is? S for support. And lower uh, left is? C for communicator. Okay. So you guys can get that. Now, Julie is saying is put your finger. Now at the top is uh, extrovert. No, at the top is direct. direct. And at the bottom is indirect. So if the top of the uh, vertical, if the top of the vertical was say a, you know a, a north, right? It's pointing north. Maybe yes. think of it like a compass. At the very top, the the line that's dividing the page in half, that's your vertical line. Right at the very top, the word direct. And at the very bottom, write the word indirect. That's right. And so you're going to put your finger in the middle and ask yourself, are you? Because it's in order to you know understand this, start with yourself. Are you generally direct or indirect? Well, do you use lots of words and tell stories? That would be indirect. Or do you use as few as possible words in conversation? Okay, so that's very direct. Move your finger up or down depending on your answer. And, you know, most people are not super extreme one way or the other, but they'll have a feel for whether they're a talker or not, so to speak. So you'll be in the upper half of the page or the lower half of the page. And next, ask yourself if you're more introverted or extroverted and move your finger left or right to see which quadrant you land on. Okay, so we got to go back to our visualization, right? Yep. Everyone claims to be a visual learner, though we've done podcasts on how that's a bunch of hooey in the past. But for those <laughs> right. of you who want to hang your hats on that. So they're looking at the piece of paper again. Yep. Remember the D for drivers in the upper left hand and the upper mm -hmm. right hand is the uh, influencer I. Mm -hmm. I. And then the lower right hand is uh, S for supportive and the lower uh, left hand is uh, analytical C. or C, right? Mm -hmm. So now on your on the uh, horizontal axis, on the side of the D and the C, right? Or if you're looking at the page, on the left side of the page now is going to be the word... Indirect. Indirect. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, introvert. 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 Right. We got yes. it confused. Introvert. And the other side is going to be extrovert. Now, what is an introvert? What is an extrovert? Yes. And I. it's okay if you guys don't naturally know that. So... An introvert is somebody who prefers to spend time by themselves if they if it's up to them, who is generally drained by big crowds. If you were a battery, you would be losing your charge. And an extrovert is somebody who is actually charged up. Their, their charge goes up in their battery when they're around people. They're people people. Sometimes they're the life of the party. There's degrees of that. 
But it here's the test, right? So if you've got a day off, you got nothing to do, your deals aren't going sideways, it's totally a day up to you. How do you spend it? Do you seek out your friends to go to an event or, you know, maybe put a party together yourself? Or do you hole up next to the fireplace with a good book? So I'll tell you a funny story. So yes. I'm on, uh, I'm talking to a few people this morning. Mm -hmm. I'm sitting on our front porch, mm -hmm. enjoying what is a gorgeous day here in the hills in the mountains of Appalachia in North Carolina. Yes. And someone asked me, and he's in, at, at Kevin, right? Mm -hmm. And he's in Puerto Rico. And Puerto Rico is basically wall to wall people. On Puerto Rico, this tiny little island, there's what, over 3 million 3. people? 3.3 million. Yeah, 3.3. Yeah, so it's not very frequent that you're not going without, yeah. you know, meeting Unless up. you're in the jungle, you're going to meet people. If you're an introvert and you're in Puerto Rico, you're going to have to often find yourself rocking in a corner in a dark room. I mean, <laughs> I'm speaking from experience because Julie and I are both introverts. Cool. But so anyway, yeah. Kevin asked me how it was. And I said, Kevin, Julie and I are happy as, you know, we have ever been because we can go days without seeing anybody. Yeah, and it's <laughs> so quiet. It's, it's so like quiet. so noticeably quiet. Right. It's almost uh, it's almost alarmingly quiet in a way. Like I wake up in the morning thinking, is everything okay? I Where the really leaf hear blowers, the lawn noise, the traffic noise. You can actually hear a bird land on a branch. Well, not only that. I mean, now we're kind of meandering <laughs> off topic. But I mean, but that you, would be introverted for you, example. Have you noticed Zoe's gotten a lot calmer? I know, but it's taken her quite some time. And she's naturally an extrovert, Yeah, right? our daughter's a totally off-the-walls extrovert. When we when we go around different places in Puerto Rico, in our community, we're mostly going on a golf cart. And people, we'll hear people, usually kids, scream at the top of their lungs, Hi, Zoe! And we hear that on a regular basis. Like so, everybody knows her. Even if we don't know their parents, everybody knows Zoe. Well, the, exactly. So she's eight, and she has more friends than we do by, like, a country mile. Well, for example, today, right, <laughs> quiet as it is, very quiet and beautiful here today, she hears one of our only neighbors who's, I don't know, probably about 15 acres away, uh, the horse whinnying. I heard it too. Yes, which was really cool. And so, of course, Zoe immediately puts her boots and her jacket on and has to go see the horse. And she already knows the horse's name and the horse Sunny. rider's name, Sonny and Kathy, the horse owner, and goes on a walk with them, right? Not, not an introverted thought in her mind. Right. So she's she's instantly friendly with everyone. Reeling this back in. So Julie and I are yeah. stark raving mad uh, introverts naturally. But obviously to do what we've done for a living, what we had to do when we were selling real estate and all the other things we've done in our lives, we had to learn to be more versatile and to be more extroverted, even though it went against the grain for us. So Julie and I could do events in front of thousands of people. And, and then after the event, we'll be as extroverted as we possibly can be. You know, we'll stand around and we'll meet people, greet people, hug people, take pictures with people. We'll, you know, a whole thing. And we'll do it just endlessly. But for like two or three days after that, we are like emotionally spent. Yeah. And we have to then go back into our dorky introverted selves to essentially recharge our own batteries. That's Whereas right. if we are natural extroverts that we would have gone to that same event and we would have been charged beyond, I mean, we could have gone to Mars without Elon Musk, basically. Riding on that high for a week or two. Or yeah. more, right? Mm -hmm. So that all I'm, we're telling you this story to make you guys laugh primarily. But the reason we're sharing this with you is because some of you guys are just like us. You're just introverts who are have learned to be more versatile or learning to be more versatile so you can work with more different types of people. Or you're the opposite of us where you're more naturally extroverted. The problem comes, and this I'm jumping mm -hmm. ahead ever so slightly, is when you are one of those two extremes and you lack the flexibility or the versatility to be able to work with people that are not just like you. Oh, Tim, I'm not like that. I'm versatile. Every single agent, every single time we've presented this always says that. To which we say, describe your spouse, describe your best friends, or more importantly, what did your, the last three transactions or five transactions, mm -hmm. what did those people do for a living? I'm not an, in, I might be an introvert, but I can work with all kinds of different clients. Okay. So your last five customers, what they did, what did they do for a living? That guy was a computer programmer. That guy was a scientist. That guy was uh, an, an actuary. Yeah. That guy was an accountant. So in other words, you're only doing business with people who are also introverted, who are very similar to you. And you it, might not realize it right. until you actually look at that. The same question go, or a, a version of that would be when you don't take a listing or 
click with a buyer. Why is that? And agents will say, well, I just didn't feel it. We didn't hit it off. Exactly. That's the lightweight version of understanding personality styles. Well, I just didn't hit it off. And if you look at your chart that you just drew, it most commonly happens in diagonals, right? Ds and Ss typically don't get along. And I's and C's typically don't get along that well because they are opposite in two ways, not just in one. So for example, the top half of the page is drivers and expressives or drivers and influencers who are both direct though in different ways, right? So they tend to at least have that communication style similar. But a driver and a uh, S, which is both, you know, your opposite and direct and indirect, and a, as well as introvert or extrovert, you don't have that much in common. So there, it requires more flexibility and versatility when you're going diagonal in the chart. So why is it that this is considered pseudoscience? And here's really a quick reason why, because any self-administered test is not scientific because you can, you with a little bit of experience, or if you know what you're doing, if you know you're taking a personality test, for example, and you want to come out more uh, seeming like an extrovert and you want to appear like an extrovert for some reason, you can actually answer the questions and maybe consciously or subconsciously, and you can make it so the results yeah. are more or less how you want them to be. All you have to do is say to yourself, well, how would an extrovert answer this? Exactly. Exactly. So self-administered tests, the very definition of any self, it's like taking a survey on Facebook. I mean, that's not a real, you know what I'm saying here, guys? So staying along the lines, it's still useful information. And the reason that we think it's useful is A, for playing around with it, kind of like we are all are now enjoying this it's sort of this information. But it's when you meet other people, going back to what we were talking about before, when you put your finger in the, in the crosshairs of, of that chart and you ask the two questions, is this person direct or indirect? Okay, so how do you know whether someone's direct or indirect? Because oftentimes in a work environment, somebody is going to uh, have been trained or evolved professionally to be more direct than they naturally are. Just that sometimes will uh, skew your, uh, your opinion of their personality style yes. to the more direct side. But I'll give you a little clue on this. Most, like if you, there have been tons and tons of research on this, and about how much of the, each population it falls into each category, right? So you have drivers, influencers, expressives, analyticals, right? So what percent of the population is drivers versus, say, amiables? Well, again, depending on what you read, more than 60% of the population falls into the amiable crowd. So an amiable person is going to be indirect. They're going to be extroverted. So they're going to be somebody that's going to be more liking people, get energized by people, and they're going to want to sit around and talk for a while. They don't want you to get to the point. They want to get to know you first. You're probably like that. Chances are 60% of the yeah. tens of thousands of you that are listening to this, potentially hundreds of thousands of you that are listening to this, you are amiable. So if you're wanting to solve the big mystery of what your dominant personality is. Statistically, it's likely that you're, you're amiable. amiable, right? And if you go down, so what's the next most common? I get these confused. Is it analytical or expressive? Do you remember? I think it's analytical. I next. think it's analytical too. Analytical. So it's amiable than analytical. And then it's expressive. And the least uh, common is driver. Even though many of you have been taught that you will suck at real estate unless you're a driver or have to act like a driver. And that's where this information gets bastardized and it ruins. So we've been standing in the back of rooms before at different conventions and whatever and listening to these gurus talk about it or they'd maybe even administered the test and now they're uh, being opinionative and they're frankly not that educated on what this truly is being pseudoscience and the agents will all basically claim to be drivers and it then the you know typically what you'll see is anybody that's analytical you know usually analyticals they're looked down upon oh analytical you're best for as a support person if you're analytical you're best if you're going to be in service to an expressive or a driver. Or you're if not, you're amiable, you're just too nice to be in this business. Yeah, you're not going to make it. You're not no, going to make it. You're, you're just not tough enough. Right? You, you want to be a driver. Okay, well, right. so here's the funny thing about drivers. And, and those of you guys have been had these experiences, hopefully you're kind of looking back at those, uh, you know, those meetings and whatnot laughing because this is how it always works out. But here's a funny thing. So the most common personality type of people, well, actually, I shouldn't say people, in men, in men's prisons, Okay. <laughs> This is what the research was. It's so the most common personality type of men in men's prisons. Cause I can't, because I don't, I've never read one about women in women's I prisons. Don't know. Right. Exactly. Was um, driver was the driver. And, and it's like, no, well, no kidding. Right. Cause when they walk into a bank, they say, give me all your money. Right. <laughs> I mean, if that's not a direct statement that I, is, I would say they're 
non-versatile drivers. <laughs> That's right. What would an amiable, <laughs> There's a difference. What would an amiable do if they're robbing a bank? Well, first of all, they wouldn't say anything. They'd at least write a note. It'd probably be sealed in an envelope with please and thank you. Or they wouldn't want to rob the bank in the first place because they wouldn't want to offend anybody and like, hurt anybody's feelings. <laughs> they do it online. Right. An expressive <laughs> would walk in with like a gazoo wearing bright colors and like yeah. make a, you know, do a little like jig and a little dance about robbing the bank. So they could feel like they earned it. Exactly. <laughs> and Well, you guys get the point, right? Yeah. But so really what you you um, don't believe that you have to be one particular personality to be successful in any aspect but of life. But you do have to be versatile. Whether Versat- you are naturally a driver or an expressive or whoever, you do have to be versatile to get along in life in general. I mean, I can look at it with uh, Zoe's classmates, right? The, the, what, one of the biggest things that they work out when they're little kids is this idea of versatility and working out conflict on the playground because you can't be an all-out driver and have any friends, really. And you can't be so amiable that anybody says anything to you. You're crushed for life. Why did you point to me when you said you can't be an all-out driver? Uh, have, I was just ha- f- have talking no with my hands. Well, you just pointed to me. Was that subconscious? <laughs> yes. Oh, uh-huh, yeah, sure it was. <laughs> no, well, but we're trying to make this really um, tactical and practical without you getting stuck in the weeds or believing that because you have a tendency towards this or towards that, that you're not going to be able to make it or life's going to be tough or you're only going to have 10% of the clients that will hit it off with you. None of that's true. So here's the thing from a coaching perspective. You again, you can be successful no matter what your personality style is. The number one job is stop worrying about what your personality style is yeah. and start worrying how to be and start focusing on being able to determine what others' personality styles are. So getting just finishing up for the a third attempt at trying to explain how to use the graph, you put your finger in the middle, you ask the person, you you based on your own observations or what you know about them, is this per is this person direct or indirect? And so you slide your finger to the top of the graph. So if you slid your finger to the top of the graph, now on your left side is going to be driver, on your right side is going to be influencer or I, right? D and I. And then the next question you have to ask yourself, is this person an introvert or an extrovert? And if they're an introvert, then you slide your finger over to the right, and that tells you they're most likely their dominant personality is a driver. And if they're an no, extrovert, left, left, upper left, left, you're right, team. left. Yep. And the opposite, obviously, if they're extroverted, you put it in the expressive thing. How do you know whether someone's an introvert or an extrovert? The best way to find out is ask them what they did the past weekend, right? <laughs> ask them what they did. You can go to their Facebook page and see sometimes. Well, yeah, I mean, if a driver Sometimes. has a Facebook page, right. well, there you yeah, go. drivers right. are going to have a, you know very short motivational quotes is what they're going to have. Yeah. But ask them what they did. So if you ask somebody what they do with their own time, not when they're working or performing or whatever they're doing, that's going to really give you the be- best mm-hmm. window into who they truly are. So if it's somebody that spends a lot of time with their families and they just do a lot of things that don't involve a lot of other humani- humans, that's going to be most likely someone who's an introvert. That's going to be a driver. And if it's somebody who's going to be the opposite, then you're dealing with an expressive. Now, if you, you're talking with someone and they're very indirect, you know, they want to get to know you first. You, you, they, they're, they, there's a little bit of a resistance to any kind of formal conversation with them. They, they're very friendly. They want to talk with you for long periods of time. And they kind of want to study you a little bit first. They right. want to observe what you're made of. They're dealing with how they feel about you. They're very feelings focused. These are the amiable types. And the analytical types, they're also going to be indirect, but they're going to be indirect in a different way than the amiables because the in, the analyticals aren't, or they're going to be, uh, you know, they're not going to, def, they're definitely not going to use a lot of words. They're definitely not going to be asking you direct questions or being in your face too much or in any way being confrontational. They're going to be almost passive aggressive, not so much so as the amiables, but they're going to be giving, they're not going to like come out with what they're thinking. You're going to have to work them a little bit and get to know them a little bit. They're going to have to trust you and you're going to earn their trust by showing them through your versatility that you too have the capacity to be analytical. But if you're dealing with somebody like that and you're expressive and it's always about life of the party, being loud and boisterous and being demonstrative and just all the rest of it. And you're dealing with a person that's very introverted and very reserved and likes to base things on facts and figures. And then you're not going to hit it off. You're not going to they're not going to like you. So if you're an expressive type, again, a lot of you are. And you'll notice probably you don't have too many clients that are, say, for example, like your accountant. Right. You know, that's because they don't, you have not developed the versatility to slow yourself down and to talk a little bit quieter and to not dress as loud, to not be as demonstrative and, and domineering, to back off and to become more like the person is that they are. So their job is not to become like you. Your job is to 
alter your personality, be more versatile so that you can be of service to them. That's right. And you have wandered into a great intro to tomorrow's podcast where we're literally going to talk about all four personality styles. We're going to give you some more, maybe we say indicators of how you know who's who, but specific to real estate, we're going to show you how you win and how you lose with each of your four personality styles. That way you can have some criteria for your prospects, your clients, your transactions, even dealing with other agents, dealing with your spouse, dealing with your kids. It's really, it's not just a real estate skill, although we're going to apply it to that. It's also a life skill. So now I'm going to be as versatile as I can. And I'm going to ask you guys to give us a five-star review on iTunes (laughs) or obviously like, and then comment if you're uh, listening to us on um, YouTube. Uh, So here's my direct way. Please just do it. Just, just get it done. Just do it. Just you, do you it have, now. You have do it now. Wouldn't now be a great time to get that done? <laughs> Very <laughs> drive review. And so, Julie, you're going to be amiable. Do do the amiable begging for the uh, reviews and the five star reviews. Okay. So here's the thing, guys. We put our heart and soul into all this for you, pretty much every day of our lives. This is what we do. It's our life's work. Could you please? Just give us a five-star review and show your gratitude because we would so much appreciate that. And a a true amiable, which Julie is not, would have taken about 20 minutes to ask that same question. So there you go. So if you're on iTunes or Stitcher or you're listening to us on some sort of podcast listening uh, widget, please do give us a five-star review. Um, And if you're on YouTube, please like and comment on the post. We certainly appreciate being of service to all of you guys. And we're going to pick up this conversation. I know all of you are going to like this. This is always one of our favorite things to talk about. And by the way, we are doing this uh, topic because uh, somebody requested it. So we do listen to what you guys say, and we do appreciate your feedback on the podcast. But we mostly appreciate your feedback on the podcast if it follows a five-star review. Yes, indeed. (laughs) You guys have a great day. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.